Hello and welcome to the Trail and Adventure Motorbike Podcast with me, Clive Barber, and my good mate, Noel Tom. For the days when you can't ride your bike, there's always the Trail and Adventure Motorbike Podcast. Welcome back again to this week's exciting episode. This week, we're delighted to welcome Chris Bright. Chris is an old friend of Noel's, now living in Bulgaria, extensively travelled throughout the world, and he's going to share some of his adventures with us. Let's do it. So have you two got history then? Well, shall I Mm. start? Go on. I Mm. met Chris many years ago when a friend of mine, JP, was trying to get hold of the Holy Grail back in the day of uh, this kind of paper, well, I suppose it was maps, or it was it was like a road book that, Chris, I think you had for the Pyrenees. Right. My, and JP yeah. had found you somehow, and you had this amazing thing that nobody else had, and he yeah. arranged to go trail riding with you one day and couldn't make it, but I could, so I went along and I met you over near Settle or somewhere over there somewhere. Yeah, and I somewhere used to it. live in Brigas and, and obviously Settle is my home turf, really, or was my home turf, you know, Yorkshire Dales. So after that, you became a bit like the, a bit of a biking guru mentor to me because you then oh. kindly invited me to Wales a few times and we did lots of trail riding in North Wales. Well, I think they're less of a guru and they're all <laughs> fine, but mentor, I don't really feel from an ability point of view that uh, I mentored you anything. You know, I was the, uh, you were merely there to pick up my bike for me. <laughs> I was quite new to trail riding, really. It was, yeah. yeah, new to people using sat naps. Now, you had a little Garmin 60 CS or CSX. I, I still have that there. And you're fact- still using it. I've I've actually got three in case I always just got back from Vietnam and I had one with one spare handset with me to use that. I mean, it just works. But you know, talking about sat navs, that that one there. Remember, like ten years ago, when the Garmin Montanas were already popular, and there was uh, five of us near Lake Baikal in Siberia, four people with sat navs and one without. And all their three of their sat navs kept out simultaneously, and mine didn't. Obviously, same brand. I mean, we all had, all four of us had the same background map, you know, an open street map, and we're all navigating to the same place. But in the end, I had to sort of uh, guide everybody else out because they, they were suddenly, you know, blind, as it were. And my old Garmin, it just does its stuff. Often it's the uh, processor in the newer ones is much faster, so everything just happens a lot quicker. Because I've got a small, I can't even remember what model it is, Garmin, but it's really, really slow to load anything. And when you do tell it where to go, it just takes ages. It can take five or ten minutes. I've got a new one on it, and it seems to work really well. And my phone as a backup. Do you put quite a meaty SD card then in your Garmin 60? It can only read up to two gigs, so you don't need a meaty one. So, Chris, I was familiarising myself with you and your travels earlier via your website, which is thebrightstuff.com, and on Instagram, Brighties Jollies. My public Facebook is, is Brighties Jollies as well. Now. I just made a list of all of the places you've been to on your motorbike. I just ignored all your other travels because this is a motorbike podcast. The list is very long, really, really long, and I was just got, I got quite angry at the end of it because I thought that's not fair. It's kind of, I like travelling on a bike, really, for my first trip. And that's when I went, did a round-the-world trip around the millennium. Came back from that, and I still like riding the bike. Now, I, did, I counted once how many countries I'd been into, you know. So downloaded the entire United Nations, 193 countries or whatever. And I put them in a spreadsheet and then coloured the ones I'd been to and the ones I hadn't. And a year or so ago, I was on 82 and including now riding the bike back from Central Asia, so from Kyrgyzstan, it's now in Armenia. Uh, I'm now on 88, if you include going to Vietnam and Laos. I just need to do West Africa. I need to do Trans-Africa down the west side to hit the 100, really, because all the rest are just islands, you know. I mean, some people have you know, shipped their bike to Fiji in order to ride around a bit to then ship it to Samoa, you know, which is a bit whatever i can't be bothered with nonsense like that even though i'm sure fiji and samoa are nice but probably best just to fly to and, and lie on a beach here's a list of some of them mentioned the usa the baja peninsula romania iceland morocco india thailand the central asia region russia mongolia vietnam argentina chile colombia cuba africa 
I'm the Isle of Man. I love going to the PT and uh, been about half a dozen times. Not going this summer, so obviously it's only in a couple of months, but I wanted to head back over there next year. Got to buy your ticket. If anybody wants to go to the TT, you always got to buy your ferry ticket 54 weeks in advance, but you only have to pay a deposit and then you pay the balance the February before the event. That's a limiting factor. So the TT is at the end of uh, May, beginning of June. So around about the 7th of May is, is when the ticket, the ferry tickets go on sale. And the plan is next year is to probably go my DRZ and just ride some trails. There's loads of trails over there. I've got a couple of routes I can send you, one for the north and one for the south of the island. So you can then kind of pick out the lanes that take you from one part of the the circuit to another. I was marshalling at Windy Corner and it, the, the marshal point is one on the outside of the circuit and then suddenly opposite us there's a fence, you know, uh, and these two dirt bikes turned up and these two lads were watching the race for all the practice for, you know, 20 minutes and then they disappeared obviously off somewhere else so you can, you know, see, spectate from some new places that maybe I haven't done before by riding the trails in, in the middle of the circuit have you always marshalled when you've gone to watch it as well? I have, yeah. I mean, you've got to give something back and, you know, you get close to the action. You know, your front row. Obviously, you can't take pictures or anything. And, uh, yes, it's good fun. And then, you know, they've got marshalls dinner and you get a discount voucher, you know, for buying merchandise. Stuff like that, but generally giving stuff back. I remember, what was it, last year... Peter Hickman, he had won that day, he turns up as a guest. There's a, a bit of problem with the with the PA system. So he's so uh, Peter is uh, wandering around the room with a microphone, sticking a microphone in somebody's mouth. They would have their hand up and then they would ask the question, which then the audience would hear. And then he would answer it wherever he was, you know. And the next day he goes out and wins, a, wins another superbike race. Am I right in thinking that the ferry is like one of the most expensive ferries in the world during TT? Oh. Yeah, it is. You know, probably return, I'm guessing now, but one man and one bike, you're on about 300 quid. Ah, uh, quid. So it's horrendously expensive. Generally, spectating's, spectating's uh, free. I'm just looking at the last time I went over last year, not for the for the TT, just for trail riding. It was £107, tripled during TT week. It seems seems daft that we're, talk, we're, we're talking to a man who's travelled around the world and been to nearly every mainland country in the world and we're talking about the Isle of Man we should really get you to introduce yourself Chris and we'll talk about your round the world trip first I would say my name's Chris Bright I'm 56 got a British and a German passport I live in Bulgaria and use this as a base it's a lovely part of the world yeah Clive you were telling me uh, how your brother lives here apparently we're virtual neighbours 20 miles away by the sound of things here it's what about 400 metres above sea level in the foothills of the Stara Planina mountains which is means old mountains in, in Bulgarian I mean essentially if you go north from here it gets a bit flat which is the, the, the sort of plains to the Danube River and then that's the border to Romania and there's other mountains, Sofia, which is a capital, which is in the west of the country. There's mountains there called the Rilla Mountains. And then you've got, along the border of Greece, you've got the Rodopi Mountains. And the uh, the Bulgarian Tet pretty much goes along the Rodopi Mountains and then up the Rilla Mountains, around Sofia, past the airport, and then up to a place called Vidin, Vidin Bridge, where it meets the Romanian and, and Serbian Tet. But around here, it, it, it's, it's proper... Not off road, you know what I mean, but you need a, you know, light is right as, as, uh... as we say very often. No, are you going to ask me if, I've, bearing in mind my brother's got a house twenty miles away from Chris, are you going to ask me if I've ever been? <laughs> well, we've already made a connection, haven't we? So, and it's a, it's a solid one this time, not one of your dubious my mate ones. Except I've never been. <laughs> it's outrageous. Why have you never been? Because you've never been invited, that's why. I've been invited, it's just I've always had better things to do. But now, if I know the tech goes near there, maybe we should uh, ride out there. And there's the rental sort of places uh, around. There is a, a tour company in Bulgaria, isn't there, you can fly and ride, fly in and ride with? Bulgaria Bike Shipping, BBS, chap called David Hyde, who, who lives up in uh, Wigan, I think it is, somewhere in... Uh, North Manchester, yeah. I'm in the same village as as a place called Motor Camp, Bulgaria, which is essentially why I moved here. Called Doug's Motor Camp. That's Doug Walker, American chap from Alabama, whose partner is a Bulgarian woman called Polly. 
Polly spent six months here and six months in the USA, in Alabama and Florida in the winter. And uh, yeah, and Evo's there and they'll, they store bikes and uh, so you could ride down and then ride a bit and then leave the bike and fly home and then come back again. You know, Sophia's got good, good flight connections to the UK. The Bulgarians are really, really good at, at motorbiking, you know, off-road particularly. And I think they even had one guy riding the Dakar this year. I mean, they're really, really into their off-road. And essentially, why not? I mean, unless you're riding across somebody's ploughed field, the only gates that are there are not to demark properties, but to keep cattle in. Often you're, you're riding all day and you don't have to get off to open and close gates. The only problem is because it's so not so populated, particularly in the spring, when stuff starts to grow again in the summer, it's just take a machete with you because <laughs> you've been fighting your way through. It's not like in the UK where there's so little to go around and, and everybody's doing it and 50 million 4x4s four have ploughed through there before. Have you seen significantly more traffic since the Tet was established? Where I am is about as far from the Tet you can be in Bulgaria. It's about, from here, it's about 150 kilometres to get to either the start or the, or the finish of it. But not really, no. I mean, we've had COVID until most recently when I've actually been here. So obviously not many people were travelling. Half the problem is for for tour companies is selling Bulgaria as a destination to go riding. When people think Bulgaria, they think sunny beach, get drunk, blokes, stag do's. And it, they don't really appreciate how much there is to do around here, you know. I mean, another mate of mine, actually, he's in the next village. He's now running a trials tour trials riding and that that's he's, he's trying to grow that and, and he would certainly show you around you know do you ride you ride trials don't you know yeah yeah i would that sounds great i would love that that's amazing well we could fly into sophia go stay at my brother's and then this place is 20 miles away let's do it so we should um get back to your around the world stuff really because you back in i think you set off in 1999 tell us what you were doing before you did that and um, and what was your inspiration for doing it and why did you do it well for getting a motorbike license in the first place i only got a motorbike license age 27 i'm born 1966 so i'll let you do the maths i was uh, bumping through uh, namibia in the back of a bus a local bus as you know namibia is a bit a bit hot and named after the namib desert this german fellow was was riding by on a red Honda XL 500 with alley boxes. I suddenly saw what I needed to do there. You know, I wanted to be like him. We actually ended up bumping into him at a campsite, me and my mate. So that was my inspiration for getting into bikes. And then I did a PGCE in 1993. While I was doing that, I worked as a binman in order to pay for my motorbike lessons. I really had a car license since I was 18. My mum threatened to throw me out of the house if I did a motorbike license. It wouldn't have been twice as expensive uh, to do both at the same time. So after five years of teaching, we're now in 1999, I just couldn't face work. I mean, I was living in uh, Birmingham, cycling a push bike everywhere to save money. And I remember cycling across Hockley Flyover in the middle of winter, about 8 p.m. after a parents' evening. Got to know, you know the cars coming past me. If you've been to Birmingham and Hockley Flyover, you'll know what I mean to head up the Hansworth Road. And I was in tears. I was like, this is a shit life. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to ride around the world on a motorbike. I've already had a bike license for a few years. At the time, I was riding a, an Africa Twin, and I made a big mistake. I sold it and, and bought a BMW, as uh, some people do. A friend of mine I'm sitting very much in touch with called Glyn Roberts to organise the Horizons Unlimited meetings. Well, actually, I was his sidekick. You know, he, did a, he was front of house, and I was the guy that did all the admin. He said, what you should do is ride set off from home. So don't, you know, ship your bike to South America and start. If you don't like it, it's a long way to ship it back. So I went, all right then. And then uh, started to go Trans-Africa. Set off, headed down to Greece and then Turkey, Syria, Jordan. In those days, you could still go off to go through Syria. Lovely country, my favourite country in that part of the world. Syrians are super, super wonderful people. A quick side trip. To Jerusalem because you could take a uh, bus from Amman to, to Jerusalem and then you got all your stamps on different bits of paper so there was no proof you were in, ever in Israel. At the time I wanted to go to Sudan and with an Israeli stamp you, know, you wouldn't have been welcome in Sudan. In the end it turns out I wasn't welcome in Sudan anyway because Sudan the next country south of Egypt. I applied in the UK and they just ignored me. I applied in Germany and they turned me down 
and then I applied in Cairo and they lost my application. So in the end, I, I wasn't too enamored by Egypt, so I had to get out of there. So I ended up air freighting my bike to Ethiopia and then going down the east side of uh, Africa to, to Cape Town and then timed it really well. I ended up teaming up with a couple of English guys in the Toyota Land Cruiser whom I'd actually met in England. And we were going to arrive in Cape Town on the 16th of March, but we thought we'd, that we delayed it up in the Western Cape uh, by 24 hours by going drinking some beers so that we'd arrive on the 17th of uh, March, which is St. Patrick's Day, so that we could pretend that the party was for us. <laughs> Genius. So that's quite hardcore then, your first experience. I suppose you, it sounds like you've travelled a bit before, but your first part of the round the world trip is to head straight into Africa, and that would probably freak quite a lot of people out. Yeah, well, before that, I mean, I'd been backpacking around, you know, in Australia. I, I drove a taxi in Sydney for for a while, you know, done all sorts of train journeys, public transport journeys in different parts of the world. If you want to be freaked out, everything's freakish, you know. What was after Africa then? I ended up uh, shipping my bike to New York and then headed up to Alaska and then down to uh, Central America. The United States Customs was at number seven, the World Trade Center. And I was there in May 2000. Obviously, we know what happened in, in September 2001. So I did the customs clearance. And then my bike was in New Jersey. I found a bus. And the guy said, I said, I want to go to here. He said, remember, this is before sat-navs and everything. And he went, yeah, I think I'm going past there. But you're going to have to uh, run across the interstate. I can let you out on the side of the road. And then you're going to have to <laughs> run five lanes of traffic, jump over the central reservation, and run five lanes of traffic. So I did that, that was fine. Then got there, turned up and said, yeah, here's my paperwork. I've come to collect a, a motorcycle. And the guy looked exactly like Bruce Springsteen and spoke just like that. He was like, well, how are you, how are you going to uh, take it away? And I went, well, I'm going to uh, put it on its, on its center stand. I just need to put the front wheel in and then I'm going to uh, ride it away. And, and he went, well, what are you doing with the box, with the packaging? You know, it was on a pallet with walls and stuff. And I said, well, uh, leave them here. And he went, no, you're not. I went, well, I could tow them. <laughs> In the end, I'm like, oh, bloody hell. So then there's a huge line of truck drivers. I just basically spoke to the audience uh, and said, guys, this is a situation, you know, around the world, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, motorbike this and that. I need to take it out, assemble it somewhere. And this bloke pipes up and says, yeah, I'll do it. And, and he turns out he was a boss of the company, so he didn't have to ask anybody permission. And he was in a low loader, and he had to just pick up a tool chest, which is about the size of a desk. But the American tool chests are, are bigger than your average tool kit in England. But he was in the low loader because that was the only vehicle that they still had that day available. So I went to uh, his warehouse at the end of Newark Airport uh, runway. So every 30 seconds or a minute, a plane was taken off. That was nice and loud. And yeah, and reassembled it. What I didn't know was that lane splitting was illegal. And I've just ridden the length of Africa, so creative riding is one way up, one way through, whatever. I remember palming off a policeman in Cairo who was trying to stop me going the wrong way up a one-way street. I wasn't really much of a rugby player, but he just collapsed. You know, just palm on my hand, straight on his chest. <laughs> so you headed north from New York then? I did, yeah. Then I went up to Canada, to Montreal, and then headed across the road of Trans-Canada, British Columbia, and then headed up the Alcan Highway, and then there was the one that goes up to, uh, what do we call it, Whitehorse, into the Yukon Territory. I forget the name of the town now. I headed across into Alaska from there through uh, a place called Chicken, Alaska, and it had Chicken International Airport because you could fly from there to Canada and back. And the airport was essentially the road. So they just closed the road off when the plane was landing. And then went up as far as the Arctic Circle sign in north of Fairbanks. And then after that, the only place was south, really. And how far south did you get? All the way to Ushuaia. Stupid question, really. I've been to Ushuaia three times, and you know how they say, leave nothing but footprints, take nothing but pictures. There's a sign, the end of the road sign, there's a wooden in a place called La Patia, and on the back, some people have graffitied, and uh, I think top right, it's my name and three dates when I was there. Oh, that's so cool. There's a prize for anybody that takes a Tampod sticker and puts it on that signpost. 
<laughs> Not sure what the prize is. Another sticker, probably. That's all we've got. Am I right in thinking this was on the BM? That's right, yeah. yeah. It was a 1989 R100GS. At the time, I thought big boxes were what it was. I mean, I even had like a pizza box on the back. So basically, it was essentially two boxes in the bit in the middle, just sitting on the subframe. My rear subframe broke multiple times. No surprises there. I rode it all to Ushuaia, and then back north again. And then I went home for a while because I needed a break and came back fully rejuvenated after a couple of months of supply teaching in England. Took uh, several river boats down the Amazon from Peru to uh, Brazil. And then, yeah, took a boat down the Amazon all the way to Belém, which is where, where the Amazon goes into the Atlantic, and then rode south through Brazil. And then at a place near uh, called Milagres, so near a place called Milagres, which is a Portuguese for miracles. Apparently, I'm the first bloke to ride a GS into the ground literally my, my, my steering head sheared off so i'm riding along only about 50 mile an hour swerving around a few potholes and then i'm thinking oh i don't think i should be able to see my see my steering head and then i had my handlebars on my knees and the bike went down on its engine well, it was a flat twin you know r100 so it went on its right hand rocker and i ended up shooting up the road until I eventually kind of went off the off the road up and took off at about for about 10, 15 mile an hour into some bushes and sand. What had broken the actual stem or part of the frame or just stem sheared off the frame? Which on these, what do you call it, on on your normal Japanese bike or whatever, is a big hefty lump of metal, isn't it? You know, whereas on those bikes, I've seen a couple of other people do it. Maybe some sort of stress fracture, and then it uh, basically on the right hand side, the the chassis stamp is riveted on. And essentially, my bike broke as if somebody had taken a knife through the uh, chassis stamp, except the chassis stamp was still held on by one rivet, you know, it sheared off the other rivet, and just clean break. So not on the weld, about, I don't know, an inch behind the weld. How old was the bike and how many miles it had it done at this point? It was a 1989 bike, so it was 10 years old, and by then it had probably done about 60, 70,000 miles. Probably a bit more, no, actually. 130,000 kilometres, 70,000 miles. How much of a mission was it to get all that fixed? I was going to say, what do you do in that situation? Because it's not a fix, is it? It's That's knackered. Well, it was. Well, essentially, I didn't fix it. Some guy, when I'd been in Salvador de Bahia, which is, you know, a big city in the north of Brazil, I pulled over again, no sat-navs then, so I was looking at my map, trying to look at my guidebook, which had a map in it, you know, where was I going? Bloke pulled over and introduced himself. He'd worked as a plumber in London and said, if there's ever a problem, give me a call. So eventually the bike ended up in, in some... Yeah, recovery wagon had came out. The police came. So I phoned this. I phoned Gabrielle and said, listen, uh, I'm the guy you spoke to. I've got a problem. In between, I chatted to a uh, the Suzuki dealer and the Yamaha dealer. And basically, my bike ended up on a quad bike pallet. Some guy who rode a Hayabusa spoke good English. He translated everything. And in the end, the bike went to southern Brazil, where where somebody welded it back together again. I mean, I could have got a new frame for it in Brazil, but I didn't want to ride it anymore. You got another bike after that? This guy I was in, in, in touch with, I had said, you know, how do I um, how do I sue BMW? How do I get my bike out of here? And he said, you don't want to do that. You want to sell it to me. And I went, oh, okay. Eventually, I got a job as a tour guide. So I ended up riding a KLR back down to Ushuaia with some American guests. And then I flew home. And then I started a, a master's degree in IT. So that was going to be my next question. You ran the world tour, sounded like it was for about three years. Yeah, two and a half. Five summers in two and a half years. I had about a week's worth of rain in two and a half years by going from a northern hemisphere to a southern hemisphere summer. And then, you know, each time, just stick to the summers. I mean, going around the world clockwise or anticlockwise, it just it doesn't cut it. Because you've got all sorts of seasons. But if you're north, south, north, south, planet right, you're always in the summer. How have you been? And you're still a serial traveller. You're still doing lots of trips. You've just got back from Vietnam. Are you funding that through IT consulting type stuff? or No. I mean, I did a master's in IT and then I ended up drifting back into uh, teaching. Got a proper IT job, got fired and thought, God, I don't need this corporate bollocks. And then drifted back into teaching because it's got long holidays. <laughs> Teachers get getting criticised at the moment or, or certain branches of the right wing press are criticising them because they're all they good lazy layabouts. With me, it was just for the holidays. 
<laughs> and, uh, and I was always very good at my job. I mean, the kids always got great results. I was a secondary IT teacher. And rather than spending time pontificating about how hard they're working or whatever, I just went off and travelled, you know? When you came back and you were teaching, did any of these kids have an idea of what you've just been doing? I'm imagining like an, an Indiana Jones kind of scenario. But most kids are interested in their own little, you know, the, the, their world, you know. And my work colleagues weren't really interested in it either. You know, I didn't really mention it just because their eyes would glaze over, you know. What's in the garage? And I, I, from our chat earlier, I, I believe there's a number of garages. I've got uh, four bikes downstairs and one bike in Armenia. I've got four Hondas and a Suzuki. Got two old Africa twins, which at the moment are both off the road because I sent the shock for one of them and the forks for the other one to be rebuilt. And the timing isn't perfect because the rebuilder, I keep on missing him. You know, so I'm away in Vietnam and he was around and now he's away. He's a race mechanic for, a, for an up-and-coming um, Bulgarian motocross lad called uh, Mikey Ivanov. It's weird, my mum's my, my visiting next week. The bike without the forks is under the stairs. Fits perfectly. It would basically block the, the uh, entrance to the kitchen if it had a front wheel and forks, but without that, it's great. And right in the middle of my bathroom is the other Africa twin without the shock, which most of get because I live on my own, I can basically do what I want. I don't have to ask anybody permission. I've got two bikes in the house, so my mum is going to be having to shuffle around an Africa twin without a shock absorber. And I, and I suppose she, she's not too uh, handy on her, on the legs at the moment, so there's always something to hold on to. Very practical. What other Hondas? Did you, did you have a Transalp at one point? Yeah, I've got an old Honda Transalp as well, a 1988 bike, which would have started life with a single disc on the front and a drum on the back. And then I got another 1998 bike, so now it's double disc on the front and a single disc on the back. And today I got it go I got it running because I want to uh, take it for an MOT tomorrow. Got an interesting history. It once spent 20 minutes completely submerged in a Mongolian river. Uh, from the infamous incident. Yeah, that's the right. Yeah. Yeah, have you seen this video, probably. Clive? Have no, I don't it? think I have. No, it's amazing. If you if you Google or if you if you search on uh, YouTube Mongolia River Transalp or something, to, no, how not to cross a river in Mongolia? <laughs> I mean, basically, I had, a, I had a German chap behind us, and he had a helmet cam on, so he videoed it all. It's basically, a river which I thought was very smooth, so it wasn't very fast. But if it's smooth water, it means it's very fast and very deep. If it's a bit choppy, it's probably quite shallow. So I went in there and fell over, put it on its back wheel, got the water out of that, spark plug out. I knew what to do because I once dropped a DRZ in the Corin car wash in North Wales. <laughs> and, um, the, 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 you know, I was on a trail riding weekend and the guys uh, helped us get the bike going. So I knew what to do. And anyway, we got the, uh, the bike going, headed back to the last hotel we'd been at and uh, yeah next day check the oil on, on those bikes you check it cold so I unscrewed the dipstick it was you know an inch above maximum and white and because the bike burnt so much oil i had three liters of oil with me because it used about a liter every thousand kilometers and I had a spare oil filter and then it was one of those things if you don't like the answer don't ask the question so the question would have been to the hotel person do you mind if i do an oil change in your car park and i didn't want to have the answer of niet so we just snuck around the side found an old kettle which had already been used to to mix paint in and uh, yeah did an oil change I mean, all, none of my electrics worked anymore, so the bike started, but my lights didn't work, my horn didn't work because they'd all got wet. And then I was obviously meant I had to ride during daylight hours only, but riding across the middle of Mongolia where there was nobody around anyway, that wasn't a problem. I'm watching it. That is, that's a large volume of water, isn't it? You can't even pick the bike up. It's squashing it down, isn't it? See, I ended up next to the bike in a slightly shallow area, and the bike was trying to fuck off down the river without me. On its own, yeah. Lying on it. Sides, so panniers, crash bars, foot pegs on the left side. And I'm in the shallow a bit. The bike's still without me and I'm trying to hold on to the bike. Once when we were out, you said to me, because I was on my red XR 650, and you said, if you're ever selling that bike, you have to sell it to me. So for a long time, you were number one on the list of people. Of yeah. people I had to contact if I was ever selling it. But then you found one. I ended up, so I've been to South America a couple of times, and in fact, the fifth bike, the, 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 
no, the four of the here, the fifth one is that bike. It is a nine is a 2004 XR 650L with an Arizona number plate. And how I found it was a guy was selling it on on Horizons Unlimited on the website. Got in touch with him. He had bought it in Arizona and rode it to Buenos Aires. Friends had checked out the bike and said it was a good bike, particularly at the price. The, the seller was in Germany. I was in Bulgaria. The bike was in Buenos Aires. And I found a guy on, on ADV Rider, who kindly a uh, chuck called Dan, did the registration. Arizona and Washington State are probably the two easiest states in the United States to, to do paperwork as a, as a non-American person. And rather than any sort of Photoshop shenanigans, I, ge- I have genuine Arizona papers for the bike. I flew to Buenos Aires, rode around southern part of South America for, for a little while. Obviously bored of the routes I'd done before, so I f- found some off-road GPX tracks from a website called andesbybike.com. But this is by bike as in by push bike. And this is bike packing. I didn't know this at the time, but I worked it out. Sometimes you carry your bicycle over landslides and whatnot in the mountains, which is a bit tricky, even with a only 145 kilo XR 650. Once I got turned around by a, by a snowstorm, that was a laugh a minute. And then the plan was to ride the bike to Colombia, but then I thought, you know what, I can't be bothered with this. And there's a Polish chap called Sambor, advrider.com. I ended up shipping my bike via Poland because he runs tours in European winters, the South American summers, and either with his rental bikes and his and his backup car, his Toyota Hilux, or the customers ship their own bikes, and then they either do their own thing or they go on a tour with him. And I basically sent the bike to Poland and then from there to Central Asia to Kyrgyzstan. So it never entered the European Union. It was in a customs bonded warehouse. And then it carried on on a truck from Warsaw to Bishkek. So I'd ridden it in February 2019 in South America. And I rode it in July 2019 in around Central Asia again in Tajikistan. Because that was a big thing I wanted to do was visit Tajikistan on the bike because... When I was there on the Transalp, we got turned around because there was a shooting war starting. So they needed to get all the tourists out so there was no witnesses. We get that in Ambleside every now and again, don't we? Bloody shooting wars. How did you find it compared to sort of the V-twins and stuff that you'd had? So fun to ride and it's got an incredibly offensive silencer. It's got an FMF Q-pipe and I think it's had various mods done to it. Still sell them somewhere. Yeah, that's a 2023 Colours. Done a massive change to them by changing the colour of them. First change in 23 years or something. It's a 20 litre tank on it. There's been lots of fair bit of modification, different suspension, and it just turns on a sixpence. You know, it's got an XR600 frame with a dominator motor with a different, slightly different gearbox and different electrics. After the Honda Cub, it's, it's the longest production Honda. Yeah, it's been going since 92, I think. So where do they make and sell them still, just in the US? They're made in Brazil. I think, or mine was made in Brazil, but they're sold in Australia and a lot in California, I think. United States, and like like uh, Noel says, in, in Australia. I'd never admit it, but if you could buy one here, I'd get one. But then COVID happened. I initially parked it there 2019 with the intention of coming back summer 20, but that didn't happen with COVID. So then September last year, so September 22, I flew there. The temporary import permit, had already expired 18 months previously, but through who you know rather than what you know, I managed to get it out. I mean, I'm there at customs trying to leave from Kyrgyzstan to Uzbekistan, and the only word I understand is contraband. I'm like, well, it's, you know, illegal stuff. And then basically I'm going, look, mate, you, you need to talk to the chief of customs in Bishkek. And then I'm kind of looking at people and there's loads, loads of work, you know, loads of customs officers and whatever. All of them have got one pip on their shoulder and suddenly I spot this guy who comes across to find out what's going on and he's got four pips on his shoulder. But he's younger than some of the one pippers. I'm like, right, he's the bot. And he's going, you know, big problem, big problem. And I'm like, look, please speak to... I was told by the head of customs in Bishkek, which was a complete fabrication, that I'm allowed to do this, you know, but speak to him. Please speak to him, please. And in the end, uh, he did. And he came back and he went, you, you go now. 
you do immigration, you go now. And I'm like, I didn't need an invite there. Pushed in front of the front of the immigration queue, stamped myself out of the country and then tried to get into and uh, got into Uzbekistan. So the DRZ you've got, is that one you've had for years? I had one before when we were trail riding in Wales together 10 or 15 years ago or whatever. I had a couple of DRZs that I went, rode around Spain and Iceland and Morocco. I sold most of my bikes when I left the UK to go traveling in 2015. And yeah, then I got back, I got another one. And uh, it was a 40,000 miler. It'd been around the world. A couple have gone around the world, him on a Transalp and her on a DRZ. I bought that as an S model. It's a 2006. And it does great. You know, I use it for trail riding, adventure riding, shall we say, uh, on, on sort of tech routes and that. So I rode southern spanish tet last year last winter and then portugal as well this ties in with neil a little bit because remember we were out riding in the lake district one day and we got talking about neil gonzalez and i think you met or had some discussion with neil gonzalez I don't know if you remember this after that conversation chris came the the fact that you were on the cover of chris scott's adventure motorcycling handbook yeah how did that come about interesting one so i know obviously know chris scott his most recent Edition, I'm not there. I'm the one on the cover where there's an Enfield with Ali with Ali boxes, my ass, steel boxes on the back. It's the one with all the prayer flags, isn't it? Yeah, it's one with the prayer flags, and there's two uh, Ladakhi women. I think I'm showing them a map or something, pretending to ask directions. A lovely guy called Gaurav Jaini, he sadly passed away a couple of years ago. An Indian filmmaker was doing a documentary. He he, he spent the entire winter up in the Himalayas. He's from, from Mumbai, you know, yeah. where it's hot and tropical and dry and hot and tropical and wet. And he spent his time up there. Was it called Ride of My Life? Ride of Your Life? If you, you can, he, he got all sorts, uh, well, he got a couple of... Um, gongs at, at a film festival oh we had lots yeah. of lovely films didn't you? i think austin vince showed some of his films a few times at his festival quite quite possibly yeah i mean yeah. i've been to any of austin's festivals but he would have been there and really great stuff sadly he passed away a few years ago way before his time but he was there and we were chatting so he ended up he took the picture and basically chris had chris scott had said yeah where are you going i'm going to india himalaya is great he said what i want i want the front cover of the book i want a picture that says global understanding monks and shit <laughs> <laughs> so that was it, you know i'm sure he had other people lined up for potential book covers so and then i saw these women and basically it had to be a portrait view not landscape the bike had to be pointing away from the spine so the front of the bike on the right of the picture and the back on the left just because apparently that's necessary and a lot of excuse me a lot of sky so none of this rule of thirds bullshit no foreground the subject and then space at the top because at the top they're right obviously the, the name adventure motorcycling handbook and then obviously chris's name and whatever else just so that it all that how it works so i said go Rev, you do that and I, and I and i was the model for it so that's global understanding monks and shit that's going in somewhere as your little byline chris it blew my mind on the day because i'd had that book by my bed for like 10 years and i'd been out for yeah. riding a few times with you all of a sudden, we're just having this conversation at the end of a track somewhere, and I start, must have mentioned that book, and you went, oh, I'm on the cover of that. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I had known you for a while at that point. Yeah, it blew my mind. Yeah, it was amazing. A uh, funny story about stumbling into things. So when I was on my Around the World trip, I ended up Bolivia, and I must admit I'd actually got stuck in a river. Again? Yeah. And with a flat horizontal twin, when the weather get, when the weather, when the water gets over your motor, it's a bit of a faff, you know, spark plug on top. Anyway, got the bike going again. And there's lots of uh, four by four tours. This bloke, uh, you know, a customer on, on one of these Jeep tours, a European chap, says, uh, further up the road, there's a, there's a bunch of Germans doing a photo shoot for BMW with a bike just like yours. I went, oh, too funny. I'm like, right. Anyway, so I'm carrying on heading up there. And then I see them, and I end, I end up having lunch with them. And basically, it was Herbert Schwartz, the founder of Touratech. He was the rider. A guy called Boris, who worked for the ad agency. A chap called Michael Martin, who's a well-known landscape photographer or motorbike adventure photographer. He does particularly deserts and mountains and stuff. He was a photographer, and then I think Michael's uh, partner, shooting video so we have a chat we do a photo and it's my bike and the 
2002 R1150 GS Adventure, the, the silver one with a red livery on it. Herbert Schwartz rode the bikes in the action shot, but he could never be in any of the pictures because he essentially was working for the competition. You know, Tour Tech was competition. I took a photo of my bike. We agreed that they were going to pay me an amount of money if, if a picture appeared. This friend of mine who had been to the Prague Motor Show or Motorbike Show says, Chris, um, you're in the BMW brochure. I went, really? And he sent me a picture of it. Oh, that's interesting. And then I contacted, uh, through Herbert Schwartz, I contacted Boris at the ad agency. I said, hello, Boris. Uh, do you remember me? I'm the guy on page 30 in your brochure and on the pull-out poster. We agreed a price for, for what you were going to pay me to be in the picture. You don't have a model release for my face. <laughs> I, I just took the 400 euros, which was, you know, the, the amount of money. I, I wasn't going to get a queue with them. Anyway, what's really funny is somewhere I have the brochure in 10 different languages. Now has got that bike now. Got, you only bought it because of me. Exactly. I buy all my bikes because of you. I sort yeah. of bought, you know, I bought my Africa Twin because when you came to visit. and you oh, said, hang, on, hang on a minute. You said that was because of Adam. Well, it was kind you of... Can't, you can't have double... I can't well, it's Adam, anyway. Guy in Africa. Is your bike rode out of the yard? Just the sound of it, I just thought, oh, that's interesting. I've got to get one of those. So it's got a venom pipe on the back, and it just mm. does no no baffles or anything. The blue Africa twin, if you go on Facebook, you'll see a picture of it. It's highly modified. The only bit that's standard, it's 1993 bike, so it's an RDO7 as well. I ended up doing a full Rothmans kit on it, uh, the front ends off a KTM. In fact, the only standard bits on it are the engine, the frame, and the swing arm, and probably the back wheel. Um, and it's got carries 40 liters of fuel, two 10 liter tanks on the front, two 10s on the back, all sorts of fancy bits and pieces. And uh, that's at the moment I've had the forks rebuilt because a KTM fork, so I didn't really uh, trust myself to do a rebuild on them myself although I'm sure it's not hard. I broke the original silencer, and now I've got a, ter a Terminini. In a terrible house fire, and if all your bikes were in the same place, which one would you drag out? Probably that one. Because you like it the most, or because you've done most to it, or a mixture of... Yeah, I've done most to it, and it's basically... I did a rally, uh, fitted the rally kit on the front of the one that you saw, but the other one has just got so modified, so tricked out. So the blue bike... I, one conveniently, one's blue and one's red, so they're easy to tell apart. I've done so much to it, and it's bike number 100, which uh, I know there's another guy who rides around with bike number 100. This one is in homage to Gilles Lallet, who won on a NXR 800RR in 1989-88. He entered four Dakars. He was on the podium three times, two seconds and a first. And sadly, on the fourth time, he uh, was involved in an accident with a spectator and sadly passed away. But the point was, it was the last time before Ricky Brabeck won the Dakar on a CRF. It was the last time that Honda had, ever had won the Dakar. You know, in between, it was Yamaha's and then KTM's. Are there and any bikes that you'd like to get your hands on that you've never owned? No, I mean, always kind of a, there's a funny uh, li line from the book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, you know, where Raul Duke is talking to his attorney, Dr. Gonzo, and they're going off on one about a Vincent Black shadow being faster than an F-111 until takeoff. But money, no object, Vincent Black shadow. And back to the travel, you've been to an awful lot of places. Where next? What, what plans have you got? Or what, where would be, what's a dream destination? I'm thinking about... Heading down the west side of Africa to Cape Town again. That's a kind of playing on my mind. I'm looking forward to this summer riding around Armenia. Well, also I've ridden around Armenia, but Georgia and then Turkey back to Europe. Potentially riding Iran, Pakistan to India. I keep on flying to places and renting bikes or buying bikes, but I never ride the ones I've got because I'm never here. So I kind of figure I've got to, I should really ride a bike from home just because it's a bike and it's mine and I should use them. I can't just, you know, park five in the garage and then, you know, fly to Nepal and rent a bike and then fly to India and buy a bike or whatever, you know. Where did you uh, find your little bike in Vietnam? It was um, a Honda winner, 150cc, uh, six gears, did 60 kilometres a litre. 
so I could get over 200 kilometers on four liters, did it great. I mean, it was just like a bigger scooter. If I wanted it to be, it was the fastest two-wheeler on the road. You know, there's obviously cars that will overtake you. Bored me a bit, you know. You can get the same engine, not as a fuel injected, in a kind of like a trail sort of chassis. So it's called an XR150. So I'd probably ride one of them. Also in Thailand, you can get CRF 250s and CRF 300s, which are built in Thailand. And so hence, if you were to buy and buy one and sell it again, you know, rather than rent it, it's likely to be cheaper than because it's made in Thailand, hasn't got the import taxes that it would have if it was imported from Japan or from Germany. Your pictures from that trip were fantastic. And I wanted to ask you if they were taken with a proper camera or a phone. Proper camera. <laughs> my, phone, my phone takes crappy, crappy pictures. It really is useless. And rather than taking my proper big SLR, DSLR with me, I bought a Panasonic Lumix LX100. It's got a four-third sensor, Leica optics, you know, stops down to F1.8. And even on a full oh. zoom, still 2.8. It's a great spot for photography, isn't it? Oh, it is. I mean, the yeah. people are very photogenic and the landscape is just awesome. And just obviously the Americans were there uh, with one of their policy, foreign policy initiatives, you know, up until 1975 and before that, the French having a bit of an empire, a go at empires. And how anybody ever would ever think that they could hold a place like that because there's mountains everywhere. It's just, the world, well, certainly the middle and the north, uh, the, this is jungle and mountains and twisty roads and really, really special. And, uh, yeah, I want to go back and actually ride an XR150. So uh, go and try and ride some off-road because often I was riding around there and you're, you're on a road which is hugging the hillside. It's straight up on one side and straight down the other. But you look into the valley and, and there's people living there. Everything's, every bit of land is used for farming or for growing or for paddy fields and stuff and uh yeah it'd be good to go back in i think october time because i think that's when the harvest is at the moment everything's green but then it'd be nice and brown apparently so when they harvest it all just looking at on your socials you've already got a little tagline that you've put in yourself is dad of the warriors but it should actually be fucking dad of the warriors <laughs> <laughs> Basically, El Padre de los Guerreros. I mean, I'm saying that with a German accent, trying to speak Spanish with a German accent. So basically, I was traveling in South America on a KLR, and I was in Colombia. And obviously now with social media, there is the Colombian KLR Owners Club. Anyway, I think we're in Medellin. Uh, Pablo Escobar used to hang out. And they come and pick me up, and we go for a burger and stuff and hang out. And then there's these two young lads. One of them is Angel's son and his mate, who at the time they were about 18. And there's this photo of me and these two lads. And the next day I'm, I'm tagged in a picture because we become Facebook friends and stuff. And it says, yeah, and last night we met Chris, a fucking da 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 you know, the fucking dad of the warriors or the dad of the fucking warriors. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm sure I was a fucking warrior or a fucking dad. And it must be, but it auto-translated from Spanish into uh, into English. I'm like, that's fucking great. I'm having that one. <laughs> so uh, we, we can have uh, the monks and shit. We can have the dyed in the wool. Or maybe I can become a dyed in the wool fucking dad of the monks and shit warriors. <laughs> That's it for this week. A massive thanks to Chris for doing that. Check out thebrightstuff.com for loads more information about Chris's travels. Also, a couple of corrections from Chris about the Polish guy that shipped his bike from South America to Kyrgyzstan via Poland. That was a chap called Sambor, and you can find him at advfactory.com. And also, if you fancy a trials adventure in Bulgaria, it's trialsbulgaria.com. The guy's name is Roy. Tell him we sent you. See you next week. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate your support. Don't forget you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you really appreciate what we do, you could consider supporting us on Patreon or buy us a coffee. Links are available on our website, which is tampodcast.com, tampodcast.com, where we also have a limited selection of branded stuff. But either way, please keep listening and spreading the word. 
See you next time.